whispers to Mrs. Kennedy or says lightly, I'm sorry for your loss, no response. Here's the crazy thing. They send her to go work on Governor Connolly, right? Because he's still in surgery also. Here's the crazy thing. Three weeks before this date, she assisted in the care of Marina Oswald, who gave birth to their second child, which we'll get into. So Nurse Hall actually helped deliver the assassin's child three weeks before this, and we'll get into that later. But talk about a gal that went full circle this thing. Three weeks prior to this assassination, she helped deliver who will be the assassin's second child. Helped deliver. Okay? All right. Well, why was there a delay in notification of death after Dr. Kemp Clark pronounced the president dead? Why didn't they just say he died at that time? Why was there a delay? No Catholics. Come on, where are my Catholics? Mrs. Kennedy insisted that he be given the last rites of the Catholic Church. So they delayed the notification of death because Mrs. Kennedy wanted a priest to be there to give her husband the last rites. So a doctor by the name of Steve Landrigan, who basically worked with the Secret Service during this whole ordeal, was the one that called for a priest to come to Parkland Hospital. So when Mrs. Kennedy requested that a priest be allowed to give her husband the last rites of the Catholic Church prior to his being pronounced dead, it was Dr. Steve Landrigan, who was there working with Secret Service agents in Parkland, who was the one that called for the priest to come to the hospital. Here's Steve Landrigan right here. Okay, he's the one that calls for the priest. So at 12.57 p.m., Father Oscar Huber arrives at Parkland Hospital with his assistant, Father James Thompson. 12.57 p.m., Father Oscar Huber, along with his assistant, James, Father James Thompson, arrive at Parkland Hospital. 12.57. At 12.57, Father Oscar Huber arrives at Parkland Hospital with his assistant, Father James Thompson. And Huber administers the last rites for President Kennedy at that point. This was his quote afterwards, Father Huber's quote. He said, quote, He was covered with a sheet which I removed from over his forehead before administering conditionally the last rites of the Catholic Church. Mrs. Kennedy bent over and seemed to kiss the president. During this most trying ordeal, the perfect composure maintained by Mrs. Kennedy was beyond comprehension. I will never forget the blank stare in her eyes and the signs of agony on her face. In a low voice, she thanked me graciously and asked me to pray for the president. Father Thompson, who also was asked to give a statement after these last rites were administered, a little different quote, kind of interesting. He said, I went to the president's wife, took her hand, and the best way I could offered my condolences. Having just left Parkland, suddenly I was aware that my right hand was sticking to the steering wheel. Then I realized that I had the blood of a president on my hand. My God. That was his statement. So when he was consoling Mrs. Kennedy, he got some of the president's you know, blood on his hand. How would you like to remember that? Well, finally, at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, because all of this is Central Standard Time, because they're in Texas, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was pronounced dead. Officially, at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was pronounced dead. After he was pronounced dead, the president's body was placed in a casket, and Mrs. Kennedy slipped off her wedding ring. And according to Sergeant Duger, who witnessed this, because now he's in trauma one as well, this is what he was quoted as saying. So after the president's body was placed in a casket, Mrs. Kennedy slipped off her wedding ring, and according to Sergeant Duger, who is now in trauma one, quote, she tried to put it on his finger, excuse me, she tried to put it on his ring finger, but it wouldn't go past the knuckle. 
She asked me to try, but I couldn't get the ring on either. We left it there on the first knuckle. I was having trouble with my vision, tears coming down. She cried just a little, then gained her composure. So can you imagine Sergeant Duger actually tried to assist Mrs. Kennedy on getting her ring on the President's ring finger, and all the farther they could get it up was the knuckle. At 1.05 p.m., back aboard that cabinet plane that was headed back to Honolulu, the voice from the White House Situation Room changed from Wayside Standby to Wayside Lancer is dead. So remember I said it went Wayside Standby, 30 seconds, Wayside Standby. Finally, at 1.05 p.m., it went from Wayside Standby to Wayside Lancer is dead. Wayside is the Secret Service name for who? Air Salinger. And Lancer is the Secret Service name for who? President Kennedy. Lace was Mrs. Kennedy's Secret Service called Lace. Well, at 1.10 p.m., Kenneth O'Donnell walked 100 feet to the room where Vice President Johnson was being held. At 1.10 p.m., Kenneth O'Donnell walked about 100 feet to the room where Vice President Johnson was being held. 1.10 p.m., Kenneth O'Donnell walked approximately 100 feet to the room where Vice President Johnson was being held. And he looked at Vice President Johnson and he said, quote, the president is dead, Mr. President. He said, the president is dead, Mr. President. What's that confirming to everybody that's in the government? The Lyndon Johnson is the new president of the United States. The only thing that hasn't happened is what? This morning, we'll talk about that later. So at 1.10 p.m., Kenneth O'Donnell walked about 100 feet to the room where Vice President Johnson was being held, and he stated to Vice President Johnson, the president is dead, Mr. President. Now, they have not officially announced the death of President Kennedy to the media yet. It hasn't gone out officially. And the man who's going to do that is Malcolm Kilduff. Malcolm Kilduff is going to have the responsibility to announce to the world that the president was dead. What was his position, do you think? Why did Malcolm Kilduff get the job? Who would normally announce it? Pierre Salinger. Because he's the press secretary. What do you think Malcolm Kilduff is? The assistant press secretary. One is a couple. So the man who officially announced the death of President Kennedy was Malcolm Kilduff. He was the assistant White House press secretary. And he was in Dallas. Why? Because Pierre Salinger, very good, was on the airplane trip to Japan. That's why he was there. Now, this was kind of interesting, because you had to be delicate in how you did this. So this is what Kilduff stated to O'Donnell, because Kenneth O'Donnell is going to have a huge role from right now until the president gets back to Washington, D.C., the, the, the dead president, okay, Kennedy. So Kilduff says to O'Donnell, Kenny, this is a terrible time to have to approach you on this, but the world has got to know President Kennedy is dead. O'Donnell's response to Kilduff was this, well... You're going to have to make the announcement. Go ahead, but you better check with check it with Mr. Johnson. As a result, Kildoff was actually the man who officially informed Vice President Johnson of the President's death. Even though Kenneth O'Donnell said that to him prior, Kildoff was the one that officially told him. Matter of fact, Johnson in the area of Parkland Hospital was one of the last, if not the last person to know that the President had died because they had him isolated away from everybody because they did not know what this was. Now, who's killed off going to get permission to announce this from? It's still not, still, go ahead. No, he's going to get it from the highest authority, which is who now? Johnson. So Kildoff has to ask Johnson for his approval to announce Kennedy's death to the public. They still haven't done this. They're still fiddling around trying to figure out how they can do this in the best way. And Kenneth O'Donnell says to Malcolm Kilduff, you have to announce this, but you better check with Mr. Johnson to see how, you, how he wants it done. So that's what Kilduff did. He went to the new president, although he's not been sworn in yet, and he asked him for his approval to announce it. Well, Johnson insisted that they didn't announce the president's death until he had left the hospital. He did not want the president's death 
announced until he had left the hospital. And there's a reason for that. Is he Johnson or no, no. Johnson ordered that the announcement of the president's death be made only after Johnson had left the hospital. He didn't want to announce until he left the hospital. And this is what he told Kilduff. He said, I think I had better get out of here before you announce it. We don't know whether this is a worldwide conspiracy, whether they are after me as well as they were after President Kennedy. And they didn't know that. So he wanted to be out of the hospital before it was announced and en route to where? Well, before that. To Air Force One so he could get back to Washington. He didn't want any risk or any vulnerability, if it, especially because they didn't know if they were trying to shoot the entire seat of government. Okay. Well, after Kilduff received confirmation that Johnson was back on Air Force One, then he made preparations to announce President Kennedy's death. So he waited until Johnson got back on the airplane. Now remember, Johnson didn't fly in on Air Force One, did he? He got there beforehand. He flew in early. He met him in San Antonio. So he didn't fly to Texas with the president, but he will fly back on Air Force One with the president's body. Well, they assembled the press in a nurse's classroom at Parkland Hospital. They assembled the press in a nurse's classroom at Parkland Hospital. So Kilduff could announce to the world that the president had died. So finally, at 1.33 p.m., Central Standard Time, 1.33 p.m., this is the announcement that Associate or Assistant Press Secretary Malcolm Kilduff stated to the press. He said, quote, President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound to the brain. I have no other details regarding the assassination of the president. 1.33 p.m., Kilduff announced to the nation and to the world the president had died. Approximately that same time, CBS News correspondent Walter Cronkite announced on national television the following statement to the American people. Now, they, I want to I go back and say, they had been getting reports from the time the president was shot at 12.30 until 1.38 p.m., that's where we're at now, they had been getting reports the president was dead, he wasn't dead, Conley was dead, he was, I mean, they were getting all kinds of mixed reports. Walter Cronkite was the type of person, one of the best journalists we've ever had, that wasn't going to announce anything prematurely. He would hear something that the president was dead, and he would say, totally unconfirmed. Totally unconfirmed. Okay? Well, finally, at 1.38 p.m., this is what he announces to the American people. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time a half hour ago. Then he, he, as you never see a journalist, and I'll show you a video, he choked up, almost started crying. This is the most stoic news reporter in the history of our country who can't hardly keep it together when he announced the president's death. So he cleared his throat and he said, Vice President Johnson has left the hospital in Dallas, but we do not know, excuse me, but we do not know to where he has proceeded. Presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become the 36th president of the United States. But I'm telling you, Walter Cronkite had a horrible time getting that out, and you'll see it. Now, he was later interviewed about his historic announcement, and this is what he said. And this is really, I think, very interesting. He said, it is an interesting thing about us news people. We are much like doctors and nurses and firemen and police. In the midst of tragedy, our professional drive takes over and dominates our emotions. We move almost like automations to get the job done. The time for an emotional reaction must wait. I was doing fine in that department until it was necessary to pronounce the words, words that struck, that stuck in my throat. A sob wanted to replace them. A gulp or two squashed the sob, which metamorphosized into tears forming in the corner of my eyes. I fought back the emotion and regained my professionalism, but it was touch and go there for a few seconds before I could continue. 
the most stoic man in American history journalism, almost started crying when he announced it. It was when you see it, you just, you'll you'll see what I mean. Well, who have we kind of forgotten about in all this mess? Governor Governor Connolly. So as far as Governor Connolly was conditioned, the news was much brighter. The man that was in charge of Governor Connolly's care was James, Dr. James Red Duke. Dr. James Red Duke was the physician in charge of Connolly's treatment. And he was doing much better than the president. So as far as Governor Connolly's condition, the news was much brighter, and Dr. James Red Duke was in charge of Governor Connolly's emergency care. As far as his condition, a bullet had punctured the governor's lung and shattered his wrist. We kind of talked about that yesterday. A bullet had punctured the governor's lung and shattered his wrist. Now this is an interesting story. While all the attention was surrounding Kennedy, people kind of in a way forgot about Connolly. And a senior medical student, not a doctor, a medical student by the name of Bill Scroggy had kind of stumbled on the governor and he noticed he was in respiratory distress. He just kind of stumbled on him. They wheeled him into the emergency room and everybody's attention started focusing in many different ways. And it was a senior medical student by the name of Bill Scroggy who actually stumbled on the governor who was unattended and he was suffering respiratory distress. And so Scroggy went and got Dr. Duke. And Dr. Duke's immediate intervention saved the governor's life. So if you look at it, Bill Scroggy probably saved Governor Connolly's life because he was being unattended. Everybody's focus was on the president. He walked by, saw that he was in respiratory distress, went immediately and went and got Dr. James Duke. And Dr. Duke's immediate intervention saved his life. So it's just kind of interesting how that happens. Well, at 3.50 p.m., Finally, somebody briefed the press on the condition of Governor Connolly. At 3.50 p.m., somebody finally briefed the press on the condition of Governor Connolly. And that was Dr. Robert Shaw. Dr. Robert Shaw. At 3.50 p.m., Dr. Robert Shaw briefed the press on the condition of Governor Connolly. This is what he stated in his briefing. Again, you don't have to write it down. If you need any of this, you can get it off the video. He stated, the condition of the governor is quite satisfactory in view of the injuries he has sustained. We believe he was in a sitting position, shot from above. We believe this is all one bullet. Okay? So I want to kind of go back to that end of the day with this. The president has died... We're going to talk about what happens with him tomorrow. There's going to be quite a, a mess. We are actually going to uh, spend tomorrow on this approver film. But we talk about these three shots. And the Warren Commission stated them as I told you. First one hit the president in the back, exit out of snow, hit the governor, caused all those injuries. Second one missed. Third one hit the president in the back of the head. There is a lot of conjecture about that. Now, I would tell you that, like I said yesterday, I don't think there's any question in my mind that three shots were fired. I'm not certain that that's the way they were. Because Connolly said from the day he could talk after this assassination that he did not believe that he was struck with the same bullet that the president was hit with. He said he actually turned and saw the president's hands go to his throat. So it makes me think that maybe that first bullet hit the president, the second one hit Connolly, the third one hit Kennedy. This thing with James Tagg is a little sketchy, and James Tagg ran a long ways with this story, but he did actually get something hit the curb and, and cut his lip because he had a drop of blood there. But that could have been a bullet fragment, could have been a lot of different things. So just something to think about when you go through this. Now tomorrow, we're going to talk about the Zapruder film. That is the film, the only film that showed the assassination. There were lots of films that showed him turning on Elm and turning, you know, off of Houston from the backside, a lot of things like that. But there was only one film that showed the assassination, and it was filmed by Abraham Zapruder, who was a dress manufacturer who had an office right in Daly Plaza. And I mean, this guy witnessed 
the most graphic, brutal assassination in this world's history through the lens of an 8 millimeter camera, and the results on him was horrific. So we're going to tell you all about that, and I'm going to show you the Zapruder film tomorrow. It's a little gross, so you have to just be able to, to deal with it. We're going to show you several different ways, really slow motion, and you can make some predictions or some ideas of where you think happened. But we're going to see that tomorrow, so it's not, it's not made for TV before lunch, so just kind of prepare yourself for that. Okay, we'll finish the Zapruder film and, and the sale of the Zapruder film tomorrow, and then I'm going to show you several videos on, uh, on what's tomorrow, Wednesday? On Thursday that I think you'll enjoy on this whole thing, okay? All right, any questions at all? Perfect.